Yeah, so in the film The Social Dilemma, we talk about this uh, lab at Stanford called the uh, Stanford Persuasive Technology Lab, uh, where the co-founders of Instagram studied and where I took a class on behavior design. The professor BJ Fogg is very famous. Notably, people need to understand that it wasn't just a lab where evil geniuses, you know, twirled their mustaches saying, how do we manipulate and persuade the world? It was actually about how do we use persuasive technology for good? So what do we mean by persuasive technology? It means just like a magician knows something about your mind that you don't know about your own mind. And it's the asymmetry of knowledge that makes the magic trick work. Persuaders have an asymmetry of information. They know something about how your mind is going to respond to a stimulus. Like if I put a red notifications badge on that product, that social media product, it's going to make people click on it more than if I put a blue one. If I make it so that when you pull to refresh like a slot machine, it'll be more addictive. That's a stronger persuasive technique to keep you coming back for more than if I uh, don't have the pull to refresh kind of feature on the on the product. Hi, welcome back to Innovative Minds. I'm your host, T+. Here with me are Tristan Harris and Audrey Tang. Building on our discussion on the dangers of persuasive technologies, let's dive further into the topic of AI ethics. Tristan, how can we establish ethical standards to ensure AI is integrated into our lives in a responsible manner? Uh, a favorite quote of mine from a mentor, Daniel Schmachtenberger, is you can't have the power of gods without the wisdom, love, and prudence of gods. When you match power with wisdom, love, and care, basically, you live in a stable society. Mm -hmm. But if you decouple power from the amount of care that's needed mm -hmm. um, to wield that power, you are going to end up in, in dangerous scenarios. Think of it like a, a biosafety level four laboratory where you have a laboratory that has this crazy power to develop pathogens that could spread around the whole world and be very dangerous. But you don't want that lab to be running the safety practices of your dentist's office. Like mm -hmm. you probably want the people in the big balloon suits, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to make sure we're matching the safety practices with the level of wisdom, love, prudence, and care mm -hmm. with the level of power distributing. The thing that worries me about generative AI is that we're rolling out all of this new power that's going to affect so many different aspects of our society. And we're not coupling or binding that power mm -hmm. to what level of care is required. Mm -hmm. And that's really the principle that I think we need to attend to. But I'd love, you know, Audrey, if you disagree with any of that mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. want to add something. Yeah, totally. Uh, and the point we made earlier about the liability uh, clauses uh, and the incentive to word bridging uh, clauses is exactly to uh, make a competition work on a level of who is more careful than the other. Yes, Not exactly. just who is more powerful than the other. I think that's the exactly. narrative frame where uh, basically uh, missing from the first contact, and it's uh, very sorely needed in the second contact. Just to link a couple concepts here, because this is profound for me when I kind of first realized it. Um, you know, part of being caring is actually caring about the whole. How whole can your perspective be? How uh, all encompassing? And if you think about what externalities are, externalities are a failure of seeing the whole, mm -hmm. because the premise, premise of an externality is you're not accounting for something. Your vision is missing something. Mm -hmm. you, you have the power of gods of Zeus and you bump your elbow and you just, you know, accidentally scorch the Amazon uh, because you weren't, your level of awareness mm -hmm. didn't match the level of your power. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I think about, uh, you know, a competition for care, it's a competition for how much you can be with the whole. Because part of the problem of any incentive or maximizing for GDP or even minimizing CO2 or increasing attention or engagement is that you're competing for a narrow incentive and any narrowly defined metric, by definition, is not reflective of the whole, the mm -hmm. whole thing. Mm -hmm. And so one of the challenges that we face is how do we reorient society to be competing for the care for the whole? Because when we have the power to actually shape the entire biosphere with our you know, whole you know, energy economy, we have the power to shape the entire information sphere of the whole world with our you know, attention economy, uh, digitally mediated by social media, we have to have those systems care for the same level of wholeness that they are impacting. And that really is, I think, the central principle. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and just as a care uh, relationship between parent and child requires whenever the child cries, the parents respond in an immediate uh, fashion, so would this listening as skill uh, need to work so that when the uh, generative AI company detect uh, that there is actually somebody crying, somebody being harmed uh, by the injustice that their system is propagating, we need to measure how quickly is this concern heard and how quickly is the realignment that is to say, the tuning of the systems um, going to happen. Like, is it within minutes, uh, within hours, within days? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is within years, then we have a real problem. 
Right. And that would reflect um, the fact that there are harms that are accruing that are not being accounted for, meaning that there's a um, harm showing up in the hole that's not seen by the hole. That there's a gap, essentially, in the amount of care that we're able mm-hmm. to provide compared to that we need to provide. So I totally uh, love that. And that's why your work is so important, because you're using technology to be able to augment that so we can better close that complexity gap that you're not, if I, one metaphor I sometimes use is if you push a button and it impacted 10 dimensions of reality. So I just, I push a button and then there are 10 dimensions of reality that are different, but then my solutioning only happens in three dimensions. So I'm mm-hmm. like trying to do cleanup in the ocean and I'm trying to clean up the air, but it turns out I was, when I hit the button, I was, I was impacting seven more dimensions that I couldn't see those seven dimensions are going to accrue over time and create more fragility or toxicity or pollution. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the kind of what we need to do, what your work is showing is how do we increase the dimensionality of care Mm -hmm. to match the dimensionality of of power and using technology. So it's not an anti-technology conversation. It's you're really showing how to do it with technology. Right. Exactly. It's, it's like in a, like a freshly frozen uh, ice sheet of a river or something. And we were crossing it. We want to pay attention, of course, to the brittle parts so that we don't all fall into the frozen river, but we want to do it in a way that's decentralized, meaning that each person uh, that is on the river is different spots somewhere. We need to have some sort of communication so that anyone who discovered vulnerabilities, right, in the ground that we're treading, uh, notify everybody. And this is like a uh, dimension scouting so that people can yes. understand what's the most existentially uh, riskful uh, and then we everybody pay attention and take care of that and exactly. so the ability to uh, sound the alarm and the ability to pay attention and to take care of each other I think is paramount uh, in this day and age yeah. and one last thing which is directing attention to repair it before those who could take advantage of those things I think about like uh, bug bounty programs and mm-hmm. security yep, systems yep. where like we want to make sure that those who discover vulnerability in the you know, thin ice of the iPhone security system uh, asymmetrically point attention to those who can repair uh, and care for that, that area rather than those who would exploit it. Uh, and wanting to make sure in AI systems, we want to extend the analogy that there's more power uh, or at least uh, privileged power going to the repair and care mm-hmm. rather than to um, the people who could exploit those vulnerabilities. Right. The most careful should win the prize. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I understand that you propose a decentralized system of vigilance, allowing all parties to report AI vulnerabilities and work together towards finding solutions. You are also in favor of regulation. But let me challenge you a bit. American commentator Noah Smith once wrote that trying to intentionally slow down the progress of industrial technology is a bad idea, because if history seems to have taught us anything, it is that we have no idea which technologies will actually displace human workers, kill jobs, and decrease wages in the future. So my question to you is, could overregulation be a break on innovation? So um, I think it's a really good question. And um, one of the arguments that people make uh, uh, against what are called the, the doomers or the, the people who are concerned with safety, um, at the very least, is that we always have moral panics about new technologies and the Luddites were worried about, you know, uh, the previous industrial revolution technologies, like you're saying. And there were even societies, I think in Turkey, that they banned the printing press when it first arrived because they were worried about what the printing press would do, right? So just to sort of uh, make sure we're steel manning or like at least mentioning the fact that they're, that's kind of the side of the argument that they take. I, I will first say that I actually don't have an opinion on whether AI will replace or augment jobs. I, I'm not an expert in that. I don't claim to have a point of view. What I'm interested in, what I'm concerned about is that AI uh, creates kinds of powers that can be used in very catastrophic ways or could have catastrophic impacts that it's very unique the printing press actually did cause a hundred years war uh uh or you know could cause a a a real disruption like that and ai could do that too but the printing press didn't automatically have the 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 ability to take a nuclear power plant and and break it right but generative ai does have the ability to hack into critical infrastructure generative ai does have the ability to um, overwhelm our legal system and our court system Uh, Generative AI does have the ability to take open societies that rely on the authenticity and veracity of information and flood it with new kinds of targeted information that could not just uh, influence people's political opinions, but could be used in ways that I won't discuss here on this podcast, but can be used in pretty uh, catastrophic ways. And so I think what we have to do is make sure we're, we're identifying what the level of like how big a problem could the misuse of that technology be? And how big could an accident, um, how, how bad could an accident be? So if I, one thing to think about is like, 
imagine the person making the biggest possible accident, a single, how, how big an accident could a single person cause in the year 1900? Like not that big of an accident, but in the year 2023, a single person can cause, you know, a pretty big accident if you're positioned in exactly mm -hmm. the right place. Like if you're working at a nuclear silo or if you're, mm -hmm. um, you know, at a biosafety level four lab. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we have to think about is as we're increasing everyone's power on top of a world that is, um, you know, more reliant on the continuity of very, you know, existingly, you know, powerful infrastructure like nuclear power plants and so on, AI does create much more risk that we have to account for and think about very, very carefully. And that's kind of the, the main thing that I believe about what we need to do to regulate AI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is about mitigating the risk. This is not about stopping GPU production. So yeah. I, I think I think we actually do, both of us, agree with Noah in that saying, let's not produce GPUs. It's not the most effective response at this point. Uh, on the other hand, uh, mitigating the risk as Exactly as you said, a gain of function research uh, doesn't, you know, take place just everywhere and anywhere. Uh, they take care of the protection of the biohazards, and even then, there were some accidents. Uh, and so, uh, the statement that I signed, um, I, I think Tristan also signed on the same statement. No, the mitigating the yeah. risk of the extinction uh, from AI, uh, including AI abuses and misuses, uh, should be a global priority alongside, like pandemic societal scale risks. And we we exactly. said alongside, especially because there are existing ways for the design of care around, say, preventing pandemics and preventing kind of function research from causing this global scale issues. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Now, I have a follow-up question for your suggestion on mitigating risks rather than inhibiting innovation. From a geopolitical point of view, one way of looking at AI nowadays is that states and companies are engaged in an arms race where the first mover gains an advantage. There is a risk of democratic states falling behind authoritarian ones, which could have severe consequences. How would you address this concern? Yes, yeah, so I think what I'm hearing you say is, um, obviously AI confers power to the states and the companies that adopt it first. And once that power is conferred, it starts a race. And if you do not coordinate that race, the race ends in tragedy. Um, uh, if it's dealing with the commons or um, you know, losing control, it's a, if it's a race to the cliff type scenario. And right now that's where we're at, right? We are in both a race between for-profit companies that are building artificial general intelligence um, who they actually was just having dinner with people who are at safety, run, uh, work on and leading safety at a couple of the major AGI labs just last night. And they said, if we could, we would actually have the whole world not pursue artificial general intelligence because they believe it's too dangerous. Mm -hmm. That's what they would prefer. Um, however, they don't know how to coordinate that outcome. And because they don't know how to coordinate that outcome and they can't stop China from pursuing it and so on, and they can't stop the other labs from pursuing it, they have to, they believe they have to build it and simply do safety right and align it and get there first. The question is, is there actually a way to do that? Now, to your point, there's one version of this democratic states losing ground to authorities, authoritarian states um, in using AI to get ahead. There's also a different sort of aspect of that, which is that open societies are more vulnerable right mm. now to yes. the capabilities that generative AI creates because in a society where there's like no surveillance, which we, we, you know, I live in the United States, there's no surveillance, uh, at least not visible surveillance of everybody, uh, in the same way that there is in let's say China. And that means that people, if I was on my computer right now and I wanted to open up something to synthesize or explore how to make certain pathogens, that's not something that the government can easily uh, track when I'm just playing around on my own computer. Whereas in China, that is probably going to be different. That's going to be more locked down. So there's two issues that I heard you sort of mentioning here. One is how do Western states use and deploy AI to gain, to maintain an advantage over closed societies? Because if they don't, they'll just lose the race economically and in terms of technological development. The other side is how to open societies, maintain resilience against the new capabilities of generative AI. And I'd love to hear what Audrey thinks about uh, balancing and managing that, because I'm, it's a, it's a really big open question. Yeah. Um, so again, taking pandemic as an example, uh, Taiwan did two things early on 2020. Uh, one is, of course, shutting down international travel. Uh, so stopping the virus uh, at a border. Uh, and the second thing, of course, is this daily press conferences at 2 p.m. Uh, that just not just teaches epidemiology, which will be 
very top down, but rather uh, let the journalist uh, ask uh, the minister a- anything and everything until they run out of questions of that day. And through this kind of every 2 p.m. Uh, conversation, uh, people generally start to understand epidemiology, start to understand why it's important to wear a mask and keep distance, wear a mask uh, is not effective unless you clean your hands and things like that. So it's um, increased what we call competence. And when people's competence uh, around a emergent threat uh, increases. People become innovative, right? The civic technologists uh, discover how to uh, visualize the rationing of masks, contact tracing that is privacy preserving, uh, many, many other things. Uh, and so increasing the capability of open society citizens in response to the democratic um, you know, uh, society threats is the most important thing that an open society can do. And I would argue it's our main advantage in that the solutions and innovations can come from everywhere and any Anywhere within our society, but it does require us putting a very clear delineation of basically saying, okay, uh, this is the civic participation platform of Taiwan, but to participate, you will have to first show that you're Taiwanese, usually uh, by using local SMS numbers. But we do have citizens that are abroad physically, and they want to participate too, and they don't have a local SMS number. So they can use FIDO or a citizen digital certificate, uh, an app basically on their phone to continue to prove that they're a citizen. But everybody else is not party uh, to this democratic uh, conversation. Uh, And so this is a idea of this stopping those uh, 5 million fake AI bots uh, at the tracks uh, akin to the border control that we took early 2020. Um, there's so many questions. Uh, so I, what I hear you saying, Audrey, is basically you created a mini shared reality mm-hmm. by having this daily press conference for mm-hmm. the whole country to be on the same page where the information that got to be deployed in that channel mm-hmm. was for the caring you know, benefit of yes. educating and informing everyone to understand epidemiology, mm-hmm. create transparency, mm-hmm. trust. Um, and in a cacophony of what would have been the rest of the kind of media environment, you created a little island of coherence mm-hmm. um, and made sure to refresh that island with new information on, I guess, every day, right? 20, yeah, every hours. 2 p.m. And anyone can call this line 1922 to add to the agenda uh, for the next right. day's uh, press conference. Yeah. Right. I guess my, my question or what I'm interested in is imagine that we're going into the 2024 U.S. elections mm-hmm. and we have the maximum incentive for Russia and China and you know different countries to be flooding the zone with not even disinformation, but just mm-hmm. taking existing truths that are spun in ways mm-hmm. that maximally divide the population mm-hmm. uh, and you know amplify them. Like, what's the equivalent of what we should have in the U.S. Mm-hmm. that you could think would be a reasonable strategy, like a mm-hmm. is it a daily... Uh, media weather storm of here's the mm-hmm. memes that are almost like a weather forecast. Here's the memes that are being deployed by our adversaries mm-hmm. or something like that. Yeah, I think weather forecast is exactly the thing, right? Uh, because we learn from the weather forecast persons uh, every day, uh, like there's uh, extra ultraviolet light or things like that. So these are actually quite scientific, uh, sometimes quite technical. But if you hear about it every day, it becomes less of a jargon, but more of a daily vocabulary. When you talk about the weather, you don't just talk about the weather, but also the science behind the weather. If you hear the weather people talking about it all the time. Uh, And I think Mm -hmm. exactly that the science, um, like uh, encountering foreign information manipulation and interference, which the EU people call FEMI, uh, which is useful because FEMI takes all sorts of ways. Exactly as you say, it's not necessarily false. It's not necessarily mis or dis information. Uh, It is sometimes true and sometimes just memes uh, that amplify the polarization. So we call it FEMI. Uh, And FEMI uh, exactly like the virus, uh, except it's of the mind, not of the body, uh, is um, basically um, the idea is that the FEMI need to run its course, but we develop antibodies not by getting everybody, uh, you know, infected without cure or vaccines, but rather having this lab in which that we very quickly wrap the mRNA, uh, right, the, the uh, traces of that FEMI uh, into this harmless uh, spike um, protein, uh, and then w- wrapping it into mRNA vaccine. That's how vaccines are made. Uh, and so there needs to be ways to very quickly identify what the trending uh, FEMI is. 
and just create comedy or whatever narratives around it that renders it non-toxic and then spread it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when you have a viral vaccine that is even more viral than the viral virus, uh, then your population is safe because people look at the mRNA strands, people laughed at it and become immune in their mind against a particular FEMI. When you think about this in the age of generative AI, is there a way to think about, hey, for all these mm -hmm. divisive memes, which are, again, mm -hmm. are not going to be untrue, they're going to be true mm -hmm. things, but they're mm -hmm. going to have a toxicity and a harm. Could we ask GPT-4 or you know the next mm -hmm. generative AI system to mm -hmm. come up with more jokes or memes exactly. that sort of exactly. inoculate us around that meme as yes. fast as that they're coming? Yes, yes. And the future is already here in Taiwan, not evenly distributed to the other parts of the world. Uh, we uh, talked about COFAX, collaborative fact-checking. Uh, and at that point, they were relying on crowdsourcing, people contributing these uh, recontextualizing, uh, clarifying information around the trending me at a day and uh, COFAX has been employing the use of language models for quite some times now exactly the way you describe it so um, the previous imbalance in which that many FEMI operators work on it as a full-time job right they actually literally work nine to five to spread the FEMI whereas the fact checkers uh, from the community are more amateurs they do it when they have spare time so that was a imbalance back then but now language models can afford to do this full-time uh, mm -hmm. in like simultaneously really with how the FEMI is first spread. So uh, if you go to the COFAX website, um, like all, all the time, the first clarifying contextualizing comments comes from a language model. So Audrey, a question I've been wanting to ask you is, um, how do we make sure that the vaccine is more, well, I don't want to use the word vaccine even because that's mm -hmm. pretty polarized in, in the United States at <laughs> the least. The cure is um, more viral. <laughs> how do we make sure that the cure is more viral than the virus? And, you know, you talk about using comedy. Mm -hmm. um, you can do that in a bespoke way. But if we really care about doing this in scale, like we're talking about open societies need to outcompete closed societies in the mm -hmm. age of generative AI, which mm -hmm. means that any kind of manipulated divisive memes that are being manufactured at scale mm -hmm. need to have some kind of counter response that's more viral than the incoming virus. Mm -hmm. um, and we can use generative AI to maybe get there, but I'm just curious to hear a little bit mm -hmm. more, like how, how would we do that? Yeah, exactly. Uh, the COFAX project used language models because language models literally is the only way <laughs> that you can match the speed and the variety of the virus. Uh, and to synthesize the cure using generative AI itself is um, not hindering progress. As I mentioned, we've been working uh, with the top AI labs on something called alignment assemblies. Alignment assemblies is basically a way to steer the AI based on a specific community's needs. For example, the COFAX community can run a polis conversation uh, that gets what their ideal uh, mentor, ideal caretaker of the COFAX conversation is. They would just have all the hopes, fears, conversations to one with the COFAX community uh, to the, basically raise a ideal uh, prodigy right, of uh, fact-checking and synthesizing, uh, clarifying information. And then taking this collective will of the community into the large context that many language models are now having. Now this language model can use what anthropic people call constitutional AI to train an adapter on top of a large language model that makes the mm. large language model behave the way the community wants it to behave. And in this aligned, not fully aligned, aligned to community language model can be then used to predictably generate more reliable narratives when it comes to synthesizing the cure. Hmm. And when you talked about it before, you, you made you had comedy writers making those memes mm -hmm. funny. Is there a way to do that mm -hmm. at scale with language models? Yes, uh, I think so. Yes. So uh, the idea uh, of recent research uh, from like Orca and so on is that you need uh, basically create a curriculum. Instead of like more text, the better, the more data, the better. You need to manually uh, pick like a thousand top notch jokes that makes it uh, comedic because cure uh, or facts or clarifying context is by nature more viral than falsehood. Falsehood that sounds right may be trendy for a while, but 
uh, profound truths have a way to, uh, you know, spiritual traditions, right, are basically the way for profound truths to be viral across centuries. Uh, and so what we really need is just to take those profound truths, connect it mm. to the uh, conversations of today, and then wrap it in a way um, like the, uh, I sometimes uh, look at the AI not kill everyone is a memes on Twitter. <laughs> and, and basically right. that sort of memes uh, is what we're looking for. Fascinating. Would love to talk to you more about how we can actually apply that going into the U.S. elections. I think we need a whole Manhattan Project for just uh, dealing with that in the U.S. So we'll talk uh -huh. about that offline. Yeah, Taiwan can help. It's great to hear that profound truth can withstand the test of time. We just talked a lot about the problems associated with AI and persuasive technologies. Now I'd like to talk about solutions. Tristan, could you introduce us to the notion of algorithmic accountability? Yeah, so algorithmic accountability is actually not um, an area that I think of as um, the needed solution for the social media issues, but it's often brought up. Um, and uh, obviously, we need to have transparency into how an algorithm works, um, and that's necessary. And then if it, if it works in a certain way that we don't like, we need to have the ability to make it accountable to new goals. And Audrey's work has shown how do you do democratic inputs to what those new goals should be. So I, I'm all for that. Um, I shouldn't say that I'm against algorithmic accountability. I, I think... The key thing is just making sure uh, that we don't let a system that is basically a cancer cell just be reported, giving us quarterly reports on how fast mm -hmm. or slowly it's killing its patients. Because mm -hmm. oftentimes what we, we talk about algorithm accountability, we talk about making sure that Facebook just gives us research reports on what it's doing. And if Facebook's business model is still directed in a cancerous incentive, towards a cancerous incentive, then its transparency and disclosures are, are only, again, asking a cancer cell to be accountable for its actions in a negative way without actually changing the code mm -hmm. of the cancer to being instead a healing agent. And what we really want is to change the DNA code from the cancer cell to turn it into a healing organism. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I think it's sometimes just diluted down to just mean answerable. Like you can interpolate it. Yeah, okay, right. so what, right? Uh, and uh, we talk about in the very beginning of conversation just to define it as something like liable. But liable is, of course, like twofold. One is that if it's liable to, to a fine or something, well, then if you're big enough, you just pay that fine. Uh, but uh, right. But what Tristan is basically saying is that the liability should also um, carry in it is the duty to change, uh, to yeah. basically align. And when you're yes. aligned to what care, then that kind of accountability is what we're really after. That's exactly right. There's recently a lawsuit in the United States for PFAS, uh, Forever Chemicals, that came from basically 3M. These are carbon bonded things that literally, as they recycle through our atmosphere, they don't break down. And they give cancer, you know, they give people cancer, testicular cancer, um, you know, stomach cancers, all these horrible things. And there was a lawsuit of $10 billion against 3M to, you know, for all these people who've been affected by it. But that doesn't change the fact that their bodies and, you know, their children are affected by PFOS, right? And they're not even phasing them out for another couple of years. So what we really want to make sure is we don't just have liability in the frame of dollars and costs. As, as Audrey said, we need to make sure whenever liabilities are discovered, that they have a realignment obligation to eliminate those externalities. And actually a question I have for you, Audrey, if you don't mind me taking us a little bit off track, is one of the things that I'm struggling with is it, in the form of externalities our institutions are prepared to deal with. Um, they're prepared to deal with separable, concrete, and attributable or measurable and measurable harms. Um, they're not very well equipped to deal with uh, non-attributable, long-term, chronic, and diffuse harms. I'm thinking things like air pollution, mm -hmm. lead, things that we don't discover, you know, shortening attention spans in the case mm -hmm. of social media, long-term mm -hmm. polarization, long-term self-image, body mm -hmm. image issues in the case of social media. Mm -hmm. And so in general, when we think about E.O. Wilson's quote that the fundamental problem of humanity is we have paleolithic brains, medieval institutions, and godlike tech, one of the problems of our medieval institutions is that they, the liability-based framework tends to deal with these concrete and attributable and short-term harms. Mm -hmm. And what we need are these new forms of institutions that have a fast update rate at finding these more chronic, diffuse, invisible, and non-attributable harms, and then finding ways to realign to eliminate those externalities. I'm just curious to hear your reactions to what is a 21st century institution that deals with the long-term chronic and, and non-attributable harms? Yeah, I think uh, what we're looking at 
really is new forms of institutions that are running on a different interval, uh, a different time, uh, sense of time, right? Because the institution that you talked about, uh, the quarterly report, the um, once every four year elections and so on, you know, they operate on the time scale of months, uh, quarters, years. And I said, um, I think during our conversation this time, that if the response to the harms uh, is not counted within hours or days, then we have a real problem. I, personally, exactly. I think we should settle for nothing less than a week. Anything that doesn't bring a, about change uh, uh, from the surfacing of the harm, clear evidence of the harm, to the actionable changes. Um, if it's more than a week, then we're in big trouble. So especially because uh, it's very difficult to reverse the harms. Uh, you talk about forever chemicals, uh, right, the PFAS, uh, and they're here like literally almost forever. Uh, and so they're bound to be people that are closest to the pain, closest to the suffering, closest to the site that first experienced the suffering. They could be researchers in a gain of function lab, right? Uh, and so we need to work on institutions that let those uh, people sound the alarm bell and then uh, democratize the solution making capabilities. For example, um, when doing like hugging face, open source AI and so on, there are a lot of people who are very interested in working on the sort of LoRa's, the low rank adapters that are the alignment filters that we just talked about that aligns the community's needs. And if we mobilize these people and make sure that they don't um, see themselves as a black sheep, right? <laughs> because they work on sensor yeah. models, but rather have a way to quickly synthesize the cure for any threat and so on, then we have something that is tapping into the open source uh, community, but with the conscience. That's the most important part. You know, I, I hadn't connected the dots until just now, but this is one of the reasons that whistleblower protections are so important because people, the people who would know that PFAS, for example, forever chemicals at 3M were dangerous are the people who are closest to working at those companies who exactly. saw the dumping, the early dumping, mm -hmm. right? Because it's going to take 10 years for those communities who mm -hmm. get cancer, maybe mm -hmm. 10, 15, 20 years down the line. Mm -hmm. So we have to have a wise version of whist internal mm -hmm. whistleblower protections mm -hmm. to, I guess, preempt those long-term chronic mm -hmm. and diffuse harms. Mm -hmm. That's one of the ways is institutional reward systems and incentive systems mm -hmm. to, to, to incentivize in a decentralized way everybody who's mm -hmm. closest to that harm area who can mm -hmm. predict that that's going to happen. But then do that in a way that doesn't cause you know, what do they call it? Tatty tail or what's mm -hmm. that phrase? You know, sure. like that. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we talk about bug bounties and so on, which is uh, basically making the solution providers, right? Uh, part of the prize uh, is uh, to be more careful uh, in reporting responsible disclosure of the vulnerabilities. We need to take the same idea, but apply it to the whistleblowers of the top AI labs or really of anyone who are suffering uh, from the harm or injustice before anyone else. And if we, we can empower them, uh, just like you know, anyone can call 1922, the toll-free number, uh, to set the agenda for the counter-epidemic uh, press conference the next day, we need to have something like that as well. Yeah. Tristan, are there more and more AI researchers reflecting on the consequences of their invention? I think per the beginning, um, this is a good conversation. We know we've done a lot of things right because we're referring so much to how we started. Um, one of the, I think, positive elements or effects of the social dilemma is that going into this next contact with AI, the world and people inside of technology companies are much more conscious of how we can get those risks wrong, how we can get technology wrong. Um, one thing that distinguishes AI from say social media is that literally the people who started the companies even started them with the notion of how much risk was, or was part of building it. Like people literally thinking we could break the world or end the world if we get this wrong. Imagine if social media companies, like if Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey, when they started Twitter and Facebook, said, we need the entire risk team because we know that we could wreck democracies and open societies, how different we, we would have ended up if we had started this with that consciousness, right? In the case of social media, we had to argue to this day, there are people who don't believe that Facebook, it's people inside of Facebook or people inside of Twitter who don't believe that it caused all the polarization. We've had to kind of win that argument over the course of the last decade. And we've been working very hard at that. If we're more optimistic, we do need to, um, uh, so we, have to, we can celebrate the fact that AI researchers are much more aware of the risks. Is that enough? No, I think that, um, you know, Eliezer Yudkowsky and others have, have pointed out that there are, uh, there is, I think, a 30 to 1 gap in research and investments into increasing capabilities versus increasing safety. So if you have 30 times as many people making the car go faster versus investing in the steering and the brake pedals of the car, it's not going to end up very well. 
Um, now, if, if you had an internal survey of people who work on safety who believed that compared to what they think was enough or adequate to work on safety, saying that this is plenty, then we'd be fine with the amount of people who are working on it. But right now, there's this famous survey that 50% of AI researchers believe that there's a 10% or greater chance that basically humanity goes extinct or is severely disempowered by the way that AI is currently going. And that would be like if, you know, the engineers at Boeing, um, you know, 50% of the engineers who built a plane said there's a 10% or greater chance that this plane goes down, uh, you know, currently, the way that it's currently going. So we should, you know, just like the atomic bomb where they had to calculate the probability that the first bomb would ignite the atmosphere, we should ask labs to say and have a formal attestation of what they believe um, is the likelihood that that they will disempower or actively, you know, hurt humanity, not again by intention, but due to the current clock rate of the of the industry. And we should ask the question, not should we slow down AI, but we should ask the question, are we moving at a pace that we can get this right? And I think that question is a unifying question because everyone can assess that I think we're currently moving at a pace that we're not going to get it right. And again, we have to collectively do that because China and Russia and you know United Arab Emirates, who built the big open source language model for AI, are all racing to build it. Um, and we need to be able to, I think, move at a pace that everyone would answer collectively that we're getting it right. Audrey, in a previous conversation with Professor Yuval Noah Harari, you said that we should favor AI systems to be biased towards harmlessness instead of harm, or towards honesty instead of telling lies. What are the latest developments around this matter in Taiwan? Yes, um, as Taiwan's digital minister, of course, I have a bias. Uh, my, my, and, and you may call it my mission, really, uh, or my job description. Um, so it's pinned on my Twitter, right? I, I prefer Internet of Beings rather than just Internet of Things. I prefer shared reality over isolating virtual realities. I prefer assistive uh, intelligence that let us collaborative learn uh, than machine learning that are authoritarian in nature. And so it's set on the tin, right? Right. I admit these are biases and we're putting all our budget uh, into assistive intelligence, into alignment research and development uh, and testing and certification uh, instead of putting it really any dime uh, on uh, even, you know, lar the larger language model on making them even larger because there are other people doing these things. And I happen to believe that uh, care and alignment are the important things. And uh, partly uh, through like recording podcasts such as this one. We want to make sure that people who can go into either line of research to power or to care, consider care, uh, not just more noble, but more needed uh, for the con continued existence of uh, humanity in general and civilization in this uh, era in particular. And so, yeah, I think it's about providing the best research environment, the best social uh, status, privileges, whatever, uh, to balance uh, this current uh, imbalance between power and care. I really see no other way out of this uh, dilemma that we're in. Mm -hmm. Totally. Thank you for your answer. To end this interview, I'd like to ask each of you to give one piece of advice to our audience on how they can make their lives freer in our connected age. So yeah, um, one of my suggestions uh, would be um, to make computers, uh, internet, uh, and touchscreens, uh, avoid touchscreen if you can, but otherwise make touchscreens a social object uh, to uh, have a conversation uh, across the screen with another human being, as we're having now, or uh, with your friend or child or parents look at the same screen at the same time and have conversations with each other. Uh, I think to reorient the screens as a social object uh, is going to do wonders uh, to our brainstems uh, to let us not be addicted to the isolating experience that many people are experiencing at the moment. As a uh... Audrey, am I correct that you are a former student of Doug, Doug Engelbart? <laughs> yes, uh, but not a personal student, just read uh, Doug's... Uh, read, oh, I see. Yeah, and, and made a phone call to, to him, but it's uh, a while ago, yeah. Well, it's very Engelbart, Engelbartian of you to respond that way, and I, I agree that we need more social experiences with technology. And right now we can notice that the design decisions that inform how all of our touchscreens work and home screens work um, you know, and Face ID is it's all about an individual user touching an individual object in an individual virtual reality. And I think it's very right to notice that um, that's not how a lot of objects, you know, in our physical reality were designed, you know, toasters mm -hmm. and um, uh, mm -hmm. newspapers and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, puzzles or board games that we do together. They're social objects. And when 
a lot of our rich experiences come from the sociality around technology. And, uh, you know, it's always easy to tell people, you know, take a break from your phone and disconnect for a while. Um, you didn't ask uh, about this sort of what, what were some of the things that we've done to help uh, tech companies make the world a little bit better. I'm proud to say that, you know, some of my earlier work on something called time well spent actually did lead to, um, you know, Apple, uh, you know, enhancing these screen time features and the do not disturb features on the phone and um, helping us helping us live a little bit more of a disconnected life from technology. And if you haven't done it in a while, I still have to have friends remind me to do this as simple as it is of just having a friend take away your phone for four hours and just let it let you come back to it uh, in, in a few hours and you will thank them, believe me, after they take it away because you don't notice how addicted you are until someone physically takes it away from you or try charging your phone in a different room in your house. Um, I did that recently and uh, as many years as I've been working on this, just simply charging your phone in another room uh, really makes a difference. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. a little advice. I totally agree. I've been doing that for years now. <laughs> awesome. You're ahead of me. It's through small gestures like these that we can free ourselves. I am deeply grateful to both of you for investing your time in this thought-provoking dialogue. Together, we have evaluated and crafted effective solutions for the future. If you liked today's episode, be sure to subscribe, share and let us know what you think. See you next time on Innovative Minds. Hi, I'm Tristan Harris, a co-founder of the Center for Humane Technology, and I'll see you on Taiwan Plus. Hello, I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Digital Minister. See you on Taiwan Plus.